Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Here's to the invisible ones, to the humble warriors serving behind the scenes to make a difference. You're not looking for recognition or applause. Your currency is service and your motive is love. Love for Christ, his people, and his gospel. Here's to the brave ones, to the quiet heroes, selflessly giving your time. You are there when others are not to cook a meal, hold a hand. You are there to laugh with us, pray with us, or simply to give a shoulder to cry on. Here's to the faithful ones, to the gracious laborers, giving your nights and weekends to be right where you said you'd be. Through sweat, tears, and the occasional pulled muscle or broken bone, you are there with a steady hand and a comforting smile. Here's to you, servers. We may not always know your name, but we see the fruits of your labor. We are indebted to you, not just for your efforts, but for the selfless heart behind it. We see you, and to you we say, thank you. Hey, good morning to you. Let me just uh, let me just second that uh, video. Thank you so much. Uh, the work that uh, folks do to make these things happen on Sunday morning uh, here uh, on the Klein campus and at the Woodlands, uh, especially on a soggy day like this, you can imagine uh, that's uh, it's a lot of work. And and thank you so much for all of you who do what you do to make uh, this the kind of a vibrant community of people who celebrate Jesus. So uh, thank you so much. My name is Duffy Robbins. I want to welcome you here today, those of you who are on our Klein campus, but of course, those of you who are uh, joining us from the Woodlands, great to have you guys here this morning. And if you're joining us online, uh, it's always, always uh, a treat to have you here as, as well. Uh, in his um, little book, Peculiar Proverbs, uh, Stephen Arnott Uh, offers um, a collection of kind of strange and uh, uh, peculiar proverbs from all over the world. It's kind of a uh, a fun read because he's he's really found some some classics. For example, um, from Chile, from Chile uh, comes this uh, sobering proverb, the shrimp that sleeps is carried away by the current. The shrimp that sleeps is carried away by the current or from China. How about this advice? Give a dog an appetizing name and eat him. Give a dog an appetizing name and eat him. And then from Africa, this, uh, this thoughtful observation, he who has diarrhea will find the door without asking. <clears throat> he who has diarrhea will find the door without asking. Of course, there's this old Latin proverb, other people's goats always have the biggest udders. Uh, certainly something to think about. Uh, and then there's this little motivational pep talk from Ethiopia with enough patience and saliva, even an ant can swallow an elephant. With enough patience and saliva, even an ant can swallow an elephant. I'm told that's uh, actually what got uh, Katie Ledecky to come to practice every morning. Uh, and then uh, from the good old US of A, my favorite, if at first you don't succeed, then Skydiving's not your sport. But uh, last week, if you were here, we began a two-week series uh, on the book of Proverbs that we called Wise Living in a Foolish World. And you remember, if you were here, that we talked about three faces of of folly, three marks of of foolishness. Uh, There was superheroism, uh, which is sort of the idea that this will never happen to me. Nothing bad will happen to me. Second was super I knowism, which is sort of the idea that nobody's as smart as me. And then the last one we called super bozoism, uh, which is sort of the, the voice of the gullible, the, the simple-minded who, who doesn't actually exercise discernment and simply believes, you know, it, it makes sense 
to me. So we had superheroism, super Ainoism, and, and super Bozoism, and, uh, and, and some of you had fun on the way home uh, by entertaining family members by brainstorming which of your friends or family members seem to best fit each face of folly. Uh, and, uh, and it's good sport. But this week, uh, we're actually going to go back again to the book of Proverbs. And uh, we're going to be thinking about three, my, three primary marks of wisdom. Three primary marks of wisdom. Three uh, key traits to nurture and cultivate so that we can avoid the way of foolishness. So if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And if you don't have a Bible, you see these folks, uh, some of the volunteers we just were talking about, um, they're here to hand you a Bible. And if you just put your hand up, we'll give you one so you can follow along as we read. Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And I'm going to skip down to verse 11. Verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Uh, Of course, I can't speak for everybody here uh, this morning, but I'm going to be honest and say that I think for some of us, um, the book of Proverbs can be a little bit of a downer. Uh, you, you know, you, you kind of go to the scripture and you're looking for inspiration. You're, you're looking for a hopeful word. But then you read these words from Proverbs and they can sort of come across with this uh, sort of moralistic uh, vibe, you know, telling you how you've misbehaved. Uh, it, it sort of feels like this great big uh, biblical finger is jutting out from the book of Proverbs and it's being wagged in your face. Sort of like uh, if you remember when you were in school, um, you, you know, the teacher would sort of just look at you with that sobered face and say, see me after class, you know, or, or, or like uh, maybe you get a phone call from the doctor and he says, hey, stop by the office. I want to talk about your cholesterol. Uh, it, 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 it just, it, it just kind of has this sense that something uh, unfortunate is going to be told me. And, and I think it's too bad. It's too bad that uh, we feel this way. Because it is true, the book of Proverbs uh, is definitely uh, a book of instruction and admonition. Essentially, what we're given in uh, Scripture with the book of Proverbs uh, is a library of collected materials that were written by different people. You see that as you go through the Proverbs. But they were essentially designed um, to, to, to give instruction to the young men of Israel society who were being groomed for positions of, of leadership. And that's, that's what we actually have in the text when we read through the book of, of Proverbs. But now, now as it comes to us, uh, in these words we read this morning, uh, we can actually read it as a book inst- instruction for all of us. This is sort of, this is sort of a, a user's guide for life by the author of all life himself. And that's why... Uh, The opening words of this chapter, three, are so important. Go back to the text. Look at verse one. My son, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. You you know, it's interesting. um, At least a third of the 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs uh, contain this little phrase, my son. My son, and and I think it's a reminder that these um, collected words of wisdom and warning that we actually have uh, in Proverbs are the words of a loving father, a loving father giving instruction to his son. Now, I I totally get it that 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 the the notion of of fatherly instruction uh, doesn't evoke uh, in all of us warm, uh, you know, kind of fuzzy, cozy feelings. 
Um, those of you who remember um, the old show, Leave It to Beaver, remember Leave It to Beaver? You'll remember those ominous scenes when um, Wally and the beaver would get home and June, uh, the mom would say, boys, your father wants to see you. And, uh, and you just knew, uh-oh, this is going to be uncomfortable. And they'd go in and there was stern looking Ward uh, in a suit and tie behind his desk and, uh, and he would say, boys, you know, why didn't you tell your mother and I that Eddie Haskell was demon-possessed? And, and it was just kind of scary, right? But in fact, the writer of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews describes these Proverbs as words of encouragement. Words of encouragement. Uh, in, in fact, quoting directly from this third chapter of Proverbs, um, he writes in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, these words. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father, addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. When your dad, uh, you know, scolded you for not properly using the table saw, he wasn't doing that because he didn't love you. He was doing it because he, he did love you. And he knew that you, you wouldn't be able to text your friends if you didn't have five digits on each hand. In, in other words, this was an act of love, not just an act of, of rebuke. What we read in Proverbs chapter 3 uh, about the marks of wisdom is they're given to us not, not because God doesn't love us or even because he's angry with us, but because God does love us, because he knows us. And as we read in verse 2, he knows the way of wisdom will bring us peace and help us to prosper. Two, two phrases that are uh, intended to kind of capture this wonderful Hebrew word shalom, which means uh, contentment. It means, it means fulfillment, completion, wholeness. And read these words from Proverbs chapter 3 this morning. We are pointed to three marks of wisdom. Three marks of wisdom. The first of those marks is a trusting heart, verses five to seven. Secondly, uh, a disciplined mind. The second mark is a disciplined mind, uh, verse seven, verses 21 to 23. And then thirdly, an open ear, an open ear, uh, verses 11 and 12. Let's take a closer look at each one and we'll begin with the trusting heart, the trusting heart. Let me do a little survey this morning. How many of you in the room uh, actually use GPS technology to guide you when you are on the road? Raise your hand. Almost everybody, fantastic. Okay, Here, quick survey. How many of you actually use, uh, how many of you use Siri? You just use, use your phone, use Siri, okay. How many of you use uh, Waze? Do we have any Wazers? That's a great little app, yeah, Waze. How many of you use Garmin or TomTom, something like that? Not too good for them. Uh, how about how many of you are just old school, like a thing called a map, a paper document? Yes. Okay. How many of you are like totally old school, compass and sextant? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah. I, all right. Let's just be real. How many of you actually navigate by Starbucks locations? Yeah. All right. Well. Well. Uh, you know. Let me just say, I sort of have a love-hate relationship uh, with automobile navigational aids. Uh, because I, I travel a lot, right, and, and, uh, and I rent a lot of cars, and I have this kind of ongoing struggle with never lost. And never lost, some of you probably know this, that's the, that's the uh, GPS console in Hertz rental cars, and, and so many times, uh, you know, I'll be driving along in some strange city with never lost uh, giving me directions, and I'll make a wrong turn. And as soon as I make a wrong turn, I will hear this kind of uh, obnoxious, demeaning voice that says, recalculating route. Recalculating route. And you can just hear the disgust, right? And then I'll make another wrong turn and another kind of sneering, recalculating route. And then another, you know, wrong turn, another kind of insulting, eye-rolling, uh, you know, recalculating. How I many of you ever had an experience like that where you just keep... Right? Yeah. And, 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 and you're pretty sure that, that with the next wrong turn, the never lost lady is just going to lose her temper and, and say, you know, are you serious? You know, I mean, fine, do it yourself. I don't feel safe in this car. You know, allow your wife to drive. I mean, you know, you, you just kind of have this sense. And, and, and for me, the biggest struggle, the biggest struggle with any of these navigation apps, I'll be honest, it's trust. 
It's trust. Because they begin to direct me on one course, but my own sense of direction tells me to take a different course. And I have to decide. I have to decide whose voice am I going to listen to? What we're encouraged to understand in these early verses of Proverbs chapter 3 is that the key to wisdom boils down quite simply to this question. Whose voice? Whose voice are we going to listen to? Whose voice we're going to listen to? Let's go back to those uh, familiar words in verse 5, 6, and 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. The the central theme in the book of Proverbs is that God is the fountain. God is the fountain of wisdom. And and trying to navigate the adventure of life without fully trusting in him is, is, is to get lost in, in folly. In fact, the editor of the Proverbs uses a construction that is uh, quite common actually throughout the book of Proverbs that emphasizes his point in these three verses because he uses three parallel ways of basically making the same point. Look at the text, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Then again, verse 6. In all your ways, submit to him. And then just in case we're not clear, again, in verse 7, fear the Lord and shun evil. What the writer of Proverbs understands is that our biggest barrier to wisdom is a natural tendency to want to navigate by our own devices, to navigate by our own devices. We talked about this last week, that our, our default position is, is sin, is what the Bible calls sin. We want to choose our own course. We want to do it our own way. Now, to be fair, I don't think um, most of us want to completely just disregard. We don't completely want to blow off God. We don't want to completely want to ignore his direction uh, any more than we want to you know, totally blow off you know, Siri or, or, or never lost or just kind of mute the talking lady on our GPS. Like, like you know, we let her babble while we're happily driving our own way. She keeps talking. It's nice to have the company. And, uh, and, and sometimes it's kind of helpful to have a second opinion. And, and we can even turn her up a little bit if we really get in a bad spot. The problem is, especially when it comes to God, is that most of us have a hard time trusting only him, listening only to his voice. Because we're bombarded, aren't we? We're bombarded with lots of other voices. There's the voice of the media. There's the the voices of our friends. There's the voice of your coach and the voice of your broker and the voice of family members and the voice of the the talk show host and the voice of career and the voice of uh, temptation and desire. And we live in a culture where the predominant mindset is, you know what? Sure, sure, sure. No, it's, it's good to get a little guidance from God. That's good. It's good to have that spiritual input. But at the end of the day, you ought to be able to do what seems right to you. You ought to be able to do what seems right to you. You ought to be able to choose your own course. In other words, as you begin to read through the book of Proverbs, you you start to realize the problem is is not super bozoism, and the problem is not super I knowism, and the problem is not even super heroism. The real problem is super egoism. We want to do it our way. We want to guide ourselves. We want to make our own, our own choices, trusting primarily in our own insight, leaning into our own understanding instead of trusting wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly in the wisdom of God. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 emphasizes that wisdom is rooted in full, full submission to the word of God. Look at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all, all your heart. Verse 6. In all your ways, submit 
to him. Not, not just when the root makes sense to you, uh, not just when it comes to religious matters, uh, not, not just when it's convenient. In, in all your ways, we submit to him. And, and actually, we see this reflected uh, even in these latter verses of the third chapter of, of, of the book of Proverbs, whether that's financial matters, uh, verses 9 and 10, business dealings, verses 27 to 29, or relationship issues, verses 30, 31, and 32. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, affirms the very same idea affirmed in chapter 1, verse 7, that the fear of of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The first mark of wisdom then, a trusting heart. A trusting heart. But one of the, one of the biggest keys to a trusting heart is a, a disciplined, sound mind. A disciplined, sound mind. Uh, look at those words in verse seven. Verse seven, do not... Be wise in your own eyes. Do not be wise in your own eyes. This past fall, I discovered a little book uh, called Zoom. Zoom, and, and, and what makes this little book intriguing is not just that it tells a story, but it, it tells the story without actually using any words. So uh, essentially, it begins on page one uh, with this picture, which, which looks like, you know, I don't know, a star or a, a, a starfish, or maybe a, a close-up of Bozo's hair, or you know, a close-up of some fungus growing on a taco at Chipotle. Uh, but then, uh, when you go to page two, you discover, oh, oh, okay, all right, it's a rooster. It's a rooster, and he appears to be sitting on a fence. And these kids are looking at the rooster through the window on a, a big farm except that it's not really a large farm, it's a toy farm. And this little girl is actually playing with it, except it's not really a little girl playing with a toy farm, it's a picture of a toy farm from a toy catalog being looked at by a little boy who is sitting on a big ship. Except that it's not a little boy sitting on a big ship, it's actually a picture of a ship uh, on the side of a bus. In a, in a really big city, except that it's not a picture of a, the side of a bus in a really big city. It's actually a picture of a bus on a really small TV set. And it's being watched by a guy out in the desert, except it's not actually a guy in the desert. It's a postage stamp from Arizona. And it's on an envelope being looked at by some chieftain on a South Sea island uh, who is being looked down on by someone flying over in a small airplane who is looking at the island from a few thousand feet overhead. And it's kind of a fun book because, because it, it, by the end of the book, you sort of realize that what we, thought, what we thought was one picture is actually another picture altogether. What, what we saw as the whole picture is actually only a little tiny part of a much, much bigger picture. And I mentioned this book this morning because in some ways, I, I think it points us uh, precisely to what the writer of Proverbs wants us to understand, that there is quite often much more to the picture than we think we see. There is more to the picture than we think we see. Now, we assume we know what we're looking at, but in fact, there's much more to the picture than we think we see. That's why we read in, in verse one there, do not forget my teaching. Keep my commands in your heart. You see, a sound mind, a sound mind is a mind shaped by the conviction that only God sees the full picture as it really is. Only God sees the full picture as it really is, that the only true story is the story that comes from the mind and the mouth of God. In fact, in verse five, we're warned, lean not, lean not on your own understanding. Uh, verse seven, do not be wise in your own eyes. See, the writer of Proverbs understands that, that, that it, to some extent, people of all ages, all generations, certainly today, our lives are, are wallpapered 
with, with all kinds of imagery, you know, from our uh, computer screens to the screen of our uh, phones to the screens of the local cineplex to everywhere we look, we are surrounded by, by images and pictures. And with so many uh, images, so vivid and, and so ever-present, it's hard for us, I think, uh, to remember there's a bigger picture. There, there's a bigger picture, in fact, twice in the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 14, verse 12, chapter 16, verse 25, uh, with the exact same wording uh, in, in both verses, we're given very vivid warnings about the limits of our ability to see the big picture. The writer of Proverbs puts it this way, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way that seems right but its end is the way of death. One of the biggest keys to a trusting heart is a mind that has its understanding, its, its imagination, and its focus shaped by a fear of God. It's, it's a mind that interprets every other story uh, in light of God's big story of the world. Uh, another way to think about it would be like this, to, to look at life without the clear focus of a, of a sound mind. It's like looking through the wrong end of a telescope, right? Uh, things that are supposed to be magnified actually look really, really small. And, and things that, that are, should be small look, look way, way, way bigger than they ought to look. And even if we try to look very carefully, even if we try to really hold still and get it right, everything is gonna be blown out of perspective. Uh, in fact, if you still have your Bible open, go back to Proverbs chapter 3, the latter part, verses 19 to 23. Let's look at that. The Lord, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps were broken up and the skies dripped with dew. You see how everything, everything points to God and, and to his story, to his big picture. Then we move into verse 21. My son, let them not vanish from your sight. Keep sound wisdom and discretion so there will be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. Then you can walk in your way securely and your foot will not stumble. Verse 21, let them not vanish from your sight. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. That's what we mean. That's what we mean by, uh, by a sound, a sound mind. Let's suppose you go, okay, Duffy, I, I get that. But what does that mean in, in, in everyday life? What does it mean for me to sort of uh, live and think with that sort of sound mind? Well, it, it, it means, I think, simply this, that uh, maybe you are here this morning or you're, you're joining us there in the woodlands or you're, you're joining us online and, 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 and you are this morning seeing uh, images and hearing stories from your friends or, or from a book or from somebody's you know, Snapchat or Instagram or from your bank statement or from a job review or, or, or from your doctor or from uh, a favorite politician. It doesn't matter who the favorite politician is. They're very colorful. They're sometimes very vivid, very persuasive stories. But Proverbs 3 calls out to us this morning and says, hey, do not be fooled. There's a bigger story. There's a bigger story. There's a bigger picture. Do not rely on your own insight. Or we could paraphrase it. Do not rely on your own eyesight. There is more to the picture than we think we see. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. You know this passage. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So wisdom begins with a trusting heart, begins with a trusting heart. But if it's real, it will begin to, to shape and focus a sound and disciplined mind. But even a sound and disciplined mind, even a heart that, that trusts God can still benefit from the encouragement and, and correction and advice of wise counsel. That's why in verse 1 and again in verses 11 and 12, we're reminded that a third 
mark of wisdom. A third mark of wisdom is an open ear. An open ear. Trusting heart, sound mind, open ear. Uh, one of the uh, hobbies I've kind of pursued really ever since uh, my college years uh, has been hiking and, and backpacking. My travels take me to a lot of beautiful places, and I love getting out and uh, getting on the trail and going to the back country. Uh, it's taken me to some amazing places. This, uh, however, has become worrisome to my sweet wife, Maggie, uh, because, uh, you know, she keeps reminding me I am not as young as I used to be. And there are dangers of traipsing around on these trails. So what's happened is uh, over the last uh, decade or so, she sort of embraced this uh, peculiar habit on birthdays and Christmas of giving me books that talk about disaster in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah, books with cheerful titles like Death in Yellowstone or, or Death in the Grand Canyon. Now, those are actually my two favorites from the Death In series. Uh, then, then there are the whimsical books, right, about uh, lost people who had to be uh, rescued by the Forest Service or lost people who apparently were not rescued by the Forest Service uh, or, or books about a guy who's being hunted down, chased by a hungry bear. Love to read that one with the grandkids. Uh, and then my personal favorite, uh, Unpleasant Ways to Die. Uh, now, now, I know, I know, it, 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 this is going to sound a little bit odd, but I actually like these books. I, I actually appreciate them because I, 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 I understand that in truth, the wisdom these books provides is, is helpful. It's not always pleasant reading, but it's actually helpful because I've spent enough time in the woods. I know, I know that wrong choices, bad decisions can cost uh, a lot of trouble and, and, and lead to potential disaster. And because what each of these individual authors have that I don't have is their unique experience on the trail. Like they, they have walked the trail before me. One of the consistent themes in the book of Proverbs is the value of listening to the advice and wisdom of those who've walked the trail uh, before us. Now, uh, obviously, having read through a portion of Proverbs 3, it's pretty clear one of the main sources of that counsel is, is parents. Um, right off the bat, verse 1, my son, do not forget my teaching, keep my commands in your heart. And that's a, a very consistent theme throughout uh, the book of Proverbs. If you're a young person, uh, what Proverbs says in no uncertain terms is that we need to Obey parents. You need to listen to your parents with an open ear and an open mind. You may not always like what they say, but Proverbs is, is quite clear that ignoring parental uh, advice is the way of the fool. But having said that, uh, what I think the Proverbs points to is, is the importance for all of us to have faithful, trusted advisors who will speak into our lives, whether they be parents or, or, or mentors, or a youth pastor, or, or trusted uh, friends. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Chapter 27, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Uh, in the 2011 edition of Accidents in North America Mountaineering, uh, I, I, uh, I, I know, Merry Christmas. Uh, there, there's an uh, ominous observation early in the book that reads this way. The accidents that could have been prevented and can therefore be learned from include solo climbing, climbing in poor conditions, and using poor judgment in root selection. Let me just read that again. The accidents that could have been prevented and can therefore be learned from include solo climbing, climbing in poor conditions, and using poor judgment in root selection. Did you notice the very first item on the list is solo climbing? Solo climbing. Wisdom suggests we find partners 
for the climb of, of faith. Now, for some of us, the way we do that is, is we seek out an older, uh, more mature Christian who has walked the trail ahead of us, and, and we meet with them on a regular basis to, uh, to be mentored and to be guided by them in our walk with Christ. And that, that's, that's, that's fantastic. How many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you either are a mentor for somebody like that or you have a mentor like that? Let's see a show of hands. Oh, that, that's fantastic. That, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, at the very least, what we want to try to do, I think, is find for ourselves some group of, of fellow travelers, uh, you, some people who are, who are following the Lord, walking the way of wisdom, and meet with them on a regular basis to walk and talk with them about the journey of faith. That might be a group of friends at work. It might be a, uh, a group of guys at the gym. It might be a group of moms. It could be uh, anybody. For some of you, uh, you probably know this, most of you, but we have here at Faith Bridge uh, a huge community of, of grow groups where we, where we gather together in small groups as people kind of, uh, you know, pursuing the walk together. And if you're not in a group like that, I, I completely want to encourage you this morning to think about taking that next step in your pursuit of, of wisdom. Uh, in fact, let me just say, if, if you, if you want to get more information about that, uh, you can just go to the Faith Bridge website, click on the next steps tab, and we'll help you to find a group. Because there are, there are special risks for the solo climber. And the wise person seeks companions for the journey. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 puts it this way. Walk with the wise, walk with the wise, and become wise. So the wise person has a trusting heart and a sound mind, but also, also cultivates an open ear that seeks wise counsel. Back in June, when I was actually preparing this series of messages, I, I read a news story. The article explained that uh, he was actually visiting Yellowstone National Park with his sister, and together they were exploring the Norris uh, Geyser Basin, which is, uh, as most of you know, one of the larger kind of geothermal areas there in the park. Uh, some of you who've been to Yellowstone uh, know that visitors are allowed to walk among the geysers uh, in the basin, but there are all over the place warning signs saying that it's unsafe to leave the boardwalks that provide you safe passage through uh, this geothermal area. Visitors are warned. Specifically, do not try to walk on the unstable, the unstable ground of the geyser basin. Well, he figured he could walk where he wanted to walk. It was up to him that, that he should be able to choose. And the warning song, signs, they, they, they were for other people that, that bad things don't happen to him. And so he went off the trail and he fell into one of the hot pools and they never found his body. They never found his body. Now, it was an awful accident. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard story to tell and I, I get it. It's a hard story probably even to hear but men and women, I think it's a, it's a fitting illustration of why this morning we need to take seriously these three marks of wisdom. We're living, we're living in a culture where it's considered hip, uh, progressive, sort of worldly wise, even savvy to walk where we want to walk. Ignore the signs, push the boundaries, do whatever you want to do, and don't worry, nobody is going to get burned. Wisdom cries out to us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. What it really comes down to, I think, this morning is three critical questions that I want you to consider as my brothers and sisters in Christ. First of all, whose voice? Whose voice are you gonna to listen to? Secondly, whose story are you gonna believe? And thirdly, who's walking with you so you don't get lost? May God grant us trusting hearts, a sound mind, and an open ear. Let's pray. Lord, all of us here this morning, 
we have paths that are sometimes very confusing and difficult to walk. We need, Lord, to be a people who listen for your voice, and yet there are many distractions. Would you today speak to us, even now, even in this moment, those of us who are listening to voices that would lead us astray, those of us who, who walk to the counsel of the wicked or have advisors that perhaps tempt us to, to leave the, the, the trail and, and go to places where there's grave danger. Lord, I pray today that you would give us hearts that trust in you. And if someone is listening even now to this prayer, would you, Lord, help us, help that person to say, yes, Father, I get it. I am, I am predisposed to be lost by my own sin, by my own ego, my own choices. Thank you that Jesus is my wisdom, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that through him I can come to you. Lord, help us today to open our hearts, our lives, our minds, our ears to this wise and loving Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, the business administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined by Duffy Robbins, who gave us part two in this Faces of Wisdom series that we've been in. Welcome, Duffy. Thanks. Good to be here, Sully. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you just unpacked the part two, which was showing us the faces of wisdom, three faces, the right. trusting heart, the disciplined sound mind, and the open ear. You're good. I You're listened good. today, so Way that's to go. good. Uh, enjoyed having that and got a couple of questions awesome. in for you today. Let's get to it. Let's the do first it. is, uh, why is wisdom referred to as a she in the Bible? When you look through the book of Proverbs, it's she's calling out in the night, this book of wisdom. So why a she? Because women are smarter and wiser than men. That's an answer from uh, the married man right there. There you go. There you go. Uh, well, actually... You know, that's a great question, and uh, I, I, if, first of all, were I a woman, I wouldn't read too much into it because uh, also folly is described as female, often as a prostitute, and so, uh, so you don't want to regale too much <clears throat> in, the, in the gender, but a but, uh, couple of thoughts. First of all, unlike English, um, some of our, you know, listeners to Postgre probably know this, but, but unlike uh, in English, uh, in Greek and Hebrew, words have genders. Mm. And, uh, and so when you, for example, are, are using a verb, you want to make sure that it's the right gender as well as the right tense and, you know, and that kind of thing. So, mm. and the right number of persons. So that's actually wisdom. Uh, the word for wisdom is uh, a female noun. Okay. And so, you know, so even before it's called she, that particular word, um, is a word that is is gender. It's female. So so it sort of makes sense. Um, I, I think secondly, um, it probably has something to do with the with that with sort of that with that pleading with that. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, so much of Proverbs is actually instruction. I talked about this today: a father mm -hmm. to son. Mm -hmm. That uh, that maybe it's good to have that that voice of of. The, the, the woman as well, you know, mm -hmm. maybe the idea of a woman as well. You know, we, we refer to as boats as she, but we usually name them after men. You know, it, you don't, it, you, you know, you very seldom hear, you know, the USS, you know, Pollyanna. Uh -huh. and, uh, and and so, uh, but I don't think there's any, any super uh, weighty reason that it is, uh, that it's done that way. I mean, it just happens to be that that is a, a uh, feminine noun, mm -hmm. and you got to you got to refer to wisdom some way. Of course, you know Solomon and the writers of Proverbs they personify, uh, you know, folly, and they personify uh, wisdom, and so it's it's a way of speaking. It's not meant to be taken literally. In the mm -hmm. same way that you know the mountains clap their hands is not meant to be 
uh, a, a literal thing. So it's not that wisdom is literally a female yeah. entity. It's just the type of noun that it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think largely that's it. Well, that's definitely, helpful. definitely not referring to any goddess, you know, Sophia or anything of that nature. Okay. Definitely not anything like that. Well, that's helpful and educational. So thank you. Uh, the second question that came in, um, it's a tough one. It, it's, uh, what do you do when you encounter someone who doesn't want to listen to wisdom, who almost seems to delight in folly uh, and, and just continually choose a, a path of foolishness? How do you counsel that person? Uh, how do you address that in their life? Yeah, and that's a and that's a heartbreaking situation. I mean, I'm sure there are parents that uh, are, are watching us right now who uh, feel a sort of a check in their spirit or a, uh, a tightening of the throat, or, or any of us who've had friends that we loved and and they just we see them making bad decisions. It's sort of like in slow motion, the mm -hmm. accident just happens, and we see it happening. Um, well, I think first of all uh, is the idea that, that, you know, to speak truth in love. And Paul talks about this in Galatians, that uh, he, he uses uh, a sort of a metaphor of a fisherman uh, mending a net so that you, you know, very delicate, like, uh, you know, very delicately sort of, sort of try to help this person make the corrections that are needed. But at the same time, you do this delicately because you could hurt yourself, you could hurt the other person. Um, but that's the first thing is I, I think to lovingly confront, mm -hmm. and uh, this is part of the this is part of the body, this is part of body life. Uh, if my foot is hurting, um, my hand uh, reaches down and and rubs it and wants to try to because mm -hmm. any pain in that part of the body impacts the whole body. So, mm -hmm. so it's not a matter of being judgmental. It's in my hands, not judging my foot. My mm -hmm. hand wants my foot to be well, mm -hmm. that it would be weird uh, if my foot is bleeding or broken from my hand. You know, not our problem. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to be judgmental. You're doing great. You know, so, so that's the first thing I think is to lovingly confront, but I'm going to assume here that the that person asking our question has done that. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, what, what do you do after that? Um, I think secondly, there's a point where one has to step back, and this is the hardest, hardest thing for parents, mm -hmm. but one has to step back. I think sometimes, and you see this actually reflected in Romans chapter 1, in God's dealing with us, even more specifically, you see it in Luke chapter 15, when the son, you know, the younger son, mm -hmm. wanted to take everything. Mm -hmm. We don't actually see this, but I would suspect the father first said, you know, son, why do you need to do that? Why do you want, you, you can live here. You can. But, but then, but the son said, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. The father let him go, not because the father uh, doesn't care, but because the father perhaps understands that some lessons you have to learn mm -hmm. the hard way. Uh, and, and you see that reflected in Romans chapter one, where uh, you see twice the phrase, God gave them up mm -hmm. to their desires. That phrase doesn't mean God gave up on them, but God gave them up to their desires. In other words, sometimes one of the, one of the best ways to learn how to make good decisions mm -hmm. is by making bad decisions. And yeah. we've all learned this. Sure. Um, I hate to say this, but I, I often say for parents that, that, uh, that, Part of the idea, I think, of, of, of wise parenting is provide for your children a laboratory where they can um, experiment with decisions. And of course, no parent wants to hear the word experiment with their yeah, child. Sure. But the fact of the matter is, the idea behind a laboratory is it is a place where you can fail safely. Hmm. In other words, there are enough controls in place right. that, that, that it, you're not gonna blow the place up. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, laboratories are places where people fail their way to success. And so if you said, no, you're never going to, you're never going to make a mistake. You're not going to go near that swimming pool until you learn how to swim. You're never going to, you're never going to succeed. You're never going to discover anything new. You're never going to learn how to swim. Mm -hmm. So there is a sense in which I think parents have to do this. Now, some parents are going to go, oh, oh, so you're just saying I'm supposed to just step back and let, I'm not saying that mm -hmm. I'm saying build in uh, that environment, but sometimes, and we all know this from personal experience, you learned how to make good decisions by making bad ones. Mm -hmm. And I believe <clears throat> even a loving father like God 
realizes sometimes there's no way to, to, to convince a fool of his folly mm -hmm. until he bears the consequences of his foolish decision. Sure. So um, I think that's number two, is sometimes you just have to say, okay, all right. But then number three, I would say that um, it's never too late. Nobody's too far gone. Uh, how many of us, uh, you know, are walking around as a complete surprise to anybody who knew us? Hmm. And, and they go, holy cow, I can't believe what God did in that kid's life. Sure. And we can't believe it either. Yeah. So um, even if you have to say, okay, go, mm -hmm. go, go spend your inheritance, you know, squander it, go to the far country. That's what you're going to, but you're always going to be loved here. Mm -hmm. You're always going to be welcome back here. Yeah. Um, I just went to see Finding Dory with my grandkids this oh, week. Fun. And I think one of the most poignant parts of the film is where uh, Dory comes back and there are all these paths that, that the mother and father, the mom and daddy fish have made because they want to make sure that, that Dory, whenever, you know, Dory gets near that, she knows she's welcome mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. and, uh, and that she's been loved even while she was gone. I think that's, that's much, much easier to say than it is to do it. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, that's an important part of this thing too. You don't just say, okay, to heck with you. Mm -hmm. You say go, but uh, we're not saying go because we don't care. Mm -hmm. It's go because we do and we think this is the only way you're going to learn. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great example. I mean, the son that goes away, he, he does come back. And really the response when he gets there is so perfect of the father yeah. from a long way off comes and pursues him, I think. Yeah, and he wouldn't really... have come back had he not you know, face the difficulty that he mm -hmm. faced. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, the difficulties weren't all his fault. It, you know, there was a famine. He didn't cause the famine. Mm -hmm. uh, but he squandered his money. He made some bad decisions. He was in a situation where having made those bad decisions, he faced bad consequences. Mm -hmm. But I think if he hadn't, he probably would still be in the oh. far country mm -hmm. going, yeah, yeah, I pulled it off. And so to that extent, I think uh, God can take negatives and turn them into positives. Mm -hmm. I've seen the him gospel. do it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Uh, the last question is, again, another challenging one, but it's when you get into these situations where you're trying to make a decision or uh, just in, in daily life, how do I know, am I following the voice of God or am I following a voice that's Maybe not from God, maybe my own voice when, right. and, and we right. know uh, that there's a way that seems right to man and that yeah. leads to death. So right. I don't want to get those two confused. Seems right. like a fine line. How do I make Yeah, right no, great voice? question. Important question. Um, I think that, uh, again, um, this starts with the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So hmm. first step is I'm going to seek the wisdom of God. Do not trust in my own insight. Do not lean on my own understanding. But as you say, so in other words, I'm going to start with the word. Mm -hmm. But as you say, suppose I, you know, suppose I read this passage and I think, and, and it's and it's not a prohibition or permission. It's not, you know, thou shalt not or thou shalt. It's, you know, should I take this new job? Mm. Yeah. Well, there's nothing in the Bible that says, you know, thou shalt go to Pittsburgh and, you know, work in a law firm. So, so what do I do in that case? Uh, I, I think that, first of all, the will of God is not some pinpoint on a map that God uh, is, is sort of daring you to miss. Mm -hmm. so, so I think um, if, it's, if it's something like that, God's will for our lives ultimately is not Pittsburgh or Houston or Louisville or Seattle, God's will for our life is that we seek Him. Mm -hmm. And so I can do that in a number of different places. Um, you can do that in the Father's house. You can do that in the pig's, you know, best eye, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you seek Him from different places, sure. but both of those guys at that point, um, when they came home and when He was still away, were, were in a place of seeking the Father. Sure. That's where God wants us to be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not your position, it's your direction. I think that, um, so that's the first thing. There's not one little thing. So, so if, I'm, if I'm trying to make a decision about a job or about, you know, um, about a marriage partner or something like that, or about a school that would send my child, you know, there's no clear guidance. Mm -hmm. 
I realized that, you know what, God is a big enough God. If I'm seeking him and I, mm -hmm. and I can, you know, think my motives are good, then God can, God can make their crooked way straight. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose somebody says, yeah, 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 yeah. But you said, if my motives are good, mm -hmm. and as you just pointed out, we know our motives are soured mm -hmm. and tainted by sin. You know, it's like the green pool at the Olympics. Something's in there <laughs> making it not crystal clear. And, and, and that's where I would say, that's where we benefit from walking with others. Yeah. Because they're gonna help us, mm -hmm. uh, they're gonna help us think it through. They're gonna, if they're good friends, they will, they will identify, you know, well, what about this? And I don't hear you saying this, and mm -hmm. this is not really you. And in the same way that in the, in the, in the broader picture, mm -hmm. in the church, we don't just make decisions by saying, here's what seems right to us today because there's nothing particularly in today's culture that, you know, is sets us up to make really clear decisions. And we were a culture that celebrates cat videos. So, so this is not exactly a, a moment in history of crystal clarity, right? right. Yeah. So what we do is we say, yeah, that's why we listen to the voice of tradition. That's why we listen to our brothers and sisters in Christ for the last 2,000 years. That's why we listen to the voice of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the globe. And so when we um, begin to sort of say, no, they're, you know, we're going to do our own thing here mm -hmm. as a person, as an individual, or as a church, we are on dangerous ground yeah. because, uh, because that's, as you say, that's, that's when I need to be suspicious that, that maybe my heart is being deceived. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's so helpful. You, you pointed to this in that open ear, uh, portion of the sermon, but when you invite people in to speak into your life, they can help you discern what is the right path. And, yeah. and like you said, maybe in, in a particular the job, what are your giftings? What have I seen you have success at before? And sometimes it's hard for us to see that ourselves. So it is That's so right. helpful to have some believers around you who can show you the right direction. Absolutely, so, yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for your insight. Thank you for your sermons the last two weeks. It's been My a joy pleasure, having man. you here. Always and thank song. you for joining us on Postscript. We'll be back next week as we kick off our Surrender Series with Pastor Ken. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.